Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to pick up on uh, the lovely lunch, but also the sensational people that have been here today. And just everywhere you turn, around the corridors, up and down the, the, the yards and, and different rooms, there's this smiling face that comes up and it's like, hello, can I help you? It's like, it's just a, I don't know where they're here from. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, so, thank you to all of you. It's just made today so, so sensational. Uh, what, what, I, what, I, what I'd like to, I guess, start off with is, a, is an observation of mine. I was born and bred in Australia and know my name's of uh, Italian origin. And one of the things I noticed about Australian culture is that whenever we greet people, we tend to say hello and follow it up with phrases like, there you go. <laughs> How's things? How you doing? Yeah. Most of the time we don't want to know, but, but, but that's how we do it. That's how it's a bit of a cultural trait. As, as an example, I answer the phone. Hello, this is John. Hey, John, it's Gary, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, mate, I'm all right. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Now, the reason I call, so 30 seconds later, whatever it is, we get in the conversation. And we do it with our friends as well. I had a friend of mine the other day, rugby league season has started, thank goodness. A passionate rugby league follower. And, and so we get together at the start of the rugby league season and we have a bit of a catch up for a few hours. And um, so Jack and I caught up. I forgot to ask Jack about the game that's coming up. So I rang Jack and I go, hey Jack, how you doing mate? Yeah, yeah, really good. John, yeah, how you doing? Yeah, I'm really good, Jack. Yeah, mate. I knew how it was. We're only together like an hour before and yet here we are asking how each other was. It, you know, like, I, mean, it's, I guess we, we have these ways of doing things we don't think about. It's part of our cultural nuance, if you like. And they're all around us. These habits are all around us from an individual perspective in terms of like, say, when I get up in the morning, I might duck my tea a certain way, or I might have my coffee a certain way, or I'll get out of bed in a certain way, or I'll shower a certain way. Um, uh, with Zelko, you know, it's putting, a, putting a, some love into a cup each day, which is lovely, uh, with a glass, you know, each day, filling up his glass with some love. That's a lovely daily habit. And also, obviously, from a cultural perspective, like if we meet someone, how you doing, the handshake, you know, there's, there's a lot of information in a handshake. Is it vertical? Is it on top? Is it underneath? Is it two-handed? Is it soft? Is it hard? Is it like a finger grab? There's a lot of information in the handshake when you just pause for a moment. Yeah? Or you go for the... It can be a little bit terrible going for the kiss. You know? Or you can go in for two kisses. Or you can go in for the big hug. Yeah? Very nice and cosy with the person. And they're all kind of cultural ways to do things as well. And I guess likewise in an organisation. We have habits, ways of doing things, you know, policies, procedures, frameworks. And they make life easy. You know, they, they can make life also, I guess, do things so we don't have to spend time thinking about it. And that's an example. I mean, I put on my shoes this morning. Some other people put on their shoes by the look of it. Um, some people have got shoelaces. I've got shoelaces. Each time I put on my shoes, I don't want to spend time thinking about it now. Bunny rabbit. Does it go up and over and into the burrow and out and the raven goes over the top and then where does the kangaroo fit into it? I don't want to know all the kind of I just want to put the shoes on and get out because I'm usually running late for a train or something. Yeah, so things like that, they're actually really useful. But there are times when, I guess, habits can be a little bit ineffective. There's an old saying that says, if, you don't, if you're doing what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So we need to be aware of that. We need to be able to generate choice. Because sometimes we do need to change when things become a bit ineffective. Yeah? Now, this is a history lesson. Yes? A bit of a history lesson. Does anyone know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you might not even know what it is. Now, this is an item. It's an item that was actually technologically advanced not too long ago. It's called a floppy disk. And it holds an amazing amount of data. One megabyte, I think. <laughs> it's extinct. It's almost extinct. Um, I've got one. Uh, but but it, you know, at the time, not that long ago, and now it's like, see you later. Right, there it is, we're using little thumb drives. And, and even these days, like at the start of the year to the end of the year, technology can become obsolete. So this, this notion of being able to keep up with you, like being able to adapt, being able to change is what I like to share with you some tips around that as well. Now, the other thing, I guess, and this is what I just want to read from, from the, uh, the brochure here, because I, I love this idea about mixed psychology. It says here in the brochure, you know, our theme is mixed psychology, and the difference between a mixologist and a bartender is that mixologist has stepped up his game, or her game, Mixologists are creative and willing to take risks, yeah? and this allows them to develop and master new skills. 
So we need to find a space where we can actually do that. We can touch our comfort zones a little bit. We can get out there and explore and develop our So I mean, this is a nice little visual diagram that really says what I've been saying, and that is that if we've got this one way of doing something, then I believe personally, I think it's just a, it's just a falling curve. You know, it, it's just going to be harder and harder to get by uh, whatever it is. You know, I'm, I'm talking not just from a business sense, also from a personal sense. For anyone here that's got kids, you know, I've got two very young kids, you know to be creative is a real asset. You know, ways of entertaining them, ways to keep them uh, engaged, ways of being able to muck around them. You know, get down on the carpet and, and, and get dirty and, and have fun with them and kind of stand there. I never knew Thomas existed until about three years ago. That's amazing. But Thomas the Train, how long you can spend on Thomas the Train on a track and make up stories, it's, it's just incredible. It's just, there's one piece of track and there's one train, but that train can go so many places. Yeah, Playfulness. So I've, I've, I think I've talked to him a bit. You know, I've got, I've, what I've been aiming to do is introduce this whole idea about obviously being creative, that creative has value. hasn't just got value from a business sense, from a personal sense, or you're playing with kids. I think just generally in life as well, creativity has a real value. So how do we get into this space of generating activities and generating alternatives so that we do have choice? And that's what I want to share with you is a, is a framework that I developed a while ago called the Creative Thinking Sandpit. And um, it's because I think what I've found was people are generally creative, as you just saw with the 30 second uh, presentations. What, it, what usually blocked people was that they tended to get in their own way, if you like. They tend to kind of feel a bit unsafe, they tend to block themselves. And so by creating this kind of imaginary space, it's sometimes a real space that we can kind of like step into, people felt safe. And by fairly safe, they felt it was okay to play. They felt it was okay to be generative. They felt it was okay to just get in there and have a go. Yeah? Because they knew that whatever was in that sand bit, well, some of the useful stuff they could take out, but some of the other stuff they could actually leave in and play with a little bit more. There's an old rule in creative thinking, it's called the rule of nines. And that is that to get one decent idea, you sometimes got to come up with nine that are not so decent. And that's what the sandpit allows us to do. So that's an example of what it's like to be in the sandpit. What I'd like you to do is just cross your arms. Have a look at your arms. Spend a lot of time with your arms at the time. Okay, so with my arms, it's left arm over right. Yeah. Put them down, and now cross them the other way. <laughs> and, and something as simple as just crossing our arms, we've sometimes got to think about it. We've got to spend time in that space of going, well, how does it go again? And that's what the sandpit is. So there's a sandpit, it's this place we get into and we have some fun. So I want to show you a couple of examples um, of how it's worked. Um, and there's, there's, because one of the things with the sandpit, it's really important that we just don't go in there and have, have fun. We can do that if you like. But when we're in the space of wanting to generate ideas and generate alternatives, we need to have a purpose that we go into the sandpit with. For those that remember the late Stephen Covey, he said one of his famous sayings was, begin with the end in mind. So we need to have that goal in mind. We step into the sandpit to generate ideas and ways of achieving that goal. So it's really important to be on purpose. Um, so one of the things to help us with that way is to have techniques. So we're getting that. It's the same as when you plug on the sandpit with the kids. You usually take them to trucks and toys and buckets and spades and all the rest of it. So in the same way we take toys in, we take techniques in. This particular one is called useless to useful. It's a very provocative technique and one I love playing with because it just shifts people's mindsets. It's kind of cool. So I, I, I did this, uh, this the, the most memorable example was I spent some time with an organisation. They wanted to learn how to actually do this. How to see something and see value in something beyond its face value. How to kind of, what I call, mine the tailings, if you like, get in there and kind of see what else is, is possible. And so I said, look, how about we go on the sandpit and we play with this technique, useless to useful. So how the technique works is imagine you are those people. So you're working in small groups, and I say to you, okay, you've got to come up with 20 ideas that are totally useless, totally useless, whatever it is in your group. And so you're busily scribing away and coming up with things like waterproof tea bags and inflatable <laughs> cardboards and kind of mosquito netting for submarines and on it goes. And brilliant lists, yeah? And, um, and then I go, well, you choose your most useless. Choose your most useless. And so you, so this group over here goes, yeah, we've got one. And for this particular example, this group came up with this ripper. I thought it was a great one. And that was that how about we create kids' clothing that when they step outside, it dissolves in the sun. That's pretty useless. I thought, yeah, mate, I reckon that is pretty useless. So they nominated that activity, that, that idea. I grabbed that group's most useless and I give it to another group. 
I'll now I'll take their one, I'll give it to another group, etc. So everyone is working on the most useless technique from another group. Your task now, your challenge is that how do you flip it around? How do you turn it into something useful? And what these guys did was, um, so these guys went, yeah, right, how do we do this? How do we work with this? But they came up with a really great idea, this is a few years ago now, and that is that they came up with a bracelet that what happens is it actually changes colour when it's exposed to UV light and it gets progressively redder. So by about the 15 minute mark, it's actually quite red. And that to me was a lovely, useful idea from a parent's perspective to go, well, that's a reminder, if you put on sun protection, and it's kind of like a fancy little piece that so they can actually wear it as an accessory item as well. And I thought that was a really nice way of just shifting something around they might not normally have come up with. And I think that's the thing that, in the sand pit, because we're in there and we're encouraging ourselves to play, we avoid that what we call the shiny object syndrome. And that is sometimes we get this object, this idea that comes up, and we think that we often go with the one that's most, that, that seems to be most useful. Oh, that one seems like it's got, no, that one, let's go with that one. And these ones don't seem that good, so we'll leave those aside. But we've also got to like, just park the really nice one, or the one that thinks that we think, okay, that might be a good one, and go and explore these as well. Because that's where those really useful things come out of. To me, I'm well related to people, in terms of when I've been managing people. Now, some people come to you and think, mm, yeah, I think there's something here which is kind of nurturing this person a bit. And fair enough, give them a journey, give them a story. It's the same with ideas, we give them a journey and a story. A lot of the time with ideas, we just go, come down short. And that's what the sand pit allows us to do. The other thing with the sand pit is that we honour all perspectives. There's no right, there's no wrong in the sand pit. There can't be, there just is. It's just ideas, and we work with the language of what we call yes and, not yes but. <laughs> so if someone comes up and goes, oh mate, great idea, but we haven't got the resources. We say, love it, yeah, we haven't got the resources. What we're going to do is we're just going to park that yes but statement here. We're going to honour it, because that's something of importance to you, but we're going to still create. And then we choose our ideas, and when we step out of the sand pit, we'll obviously measure that against the yes but and the resources side of it. So we honour these perspectives. This is my little kid called Chase. And I came home from, from work the other day. I've come home and he goes, Daddy, Daddy, draw Daddy, draw Daddy, Daddy, draw. I thought, excellent. You know, he's been doing some art, been practicing art. I thought, he's drawing. Well, I mean, from memory, always, he's got some kind of picture, but he's drawing. You know, I'm just really curious to see what he thought of me. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. <laughs> That's what I was hoping he would have drawn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe in a few years, a bit more, some more art lessons and, and what have you. But it's like you're a it allows us to do that. It allows us to feel safe. Yeah. So I want to leave you with one last story that, that um, I guess one of my favourite uh, memories of like working in national parks and wildlife service, in which playfulness was a real asset for me. And this is going back quite a few years when I worked as a ranger with national parks. I used to work up here at Blue Mountains for a while. This is when I was working at Cringot Chase National Park. And so we had, our, we had our central kind of pod with one phone at that time. And we'd all have, we had five rangers in the room. And so at that time, we had what we called a duty ranger. And the duty ranger's job was that during that day, they would respond to any calls from the public. And so this particular day, I was the duty ranger. So I'm sitting there at the desk. And the call comes through and goes, call for duty ranger line one. Call for duty ranger line one. I've gone, cool. So I've got up and I've gone over and I've picked up the phone. I've answered the phone, like, hello National Parks, this is John. Wow! <laughs> There's a scream at the other end of the phone. It's like, whoa. It's like, oh, hello, can I help you? You know, your wildlife, you've got to learn to control your wildlife. They're, they're just, they're causing havoc in these streets. It's like, okay, so tell me what happened. She goes, I'm out there, I'm out there doing my, pulling my washing in because the storm's coming and, and your Goanna came and threatened me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my Goanna? Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. Show me a little bit about what happened. And so she played the scene out. Here she is. So we've got this storm coming in. It's a bit of a plateau. And I've got this little visualisation of these cloud, you know, grey clouds rolling in. She's out there on this lovely hill's hoist. And, um, and, and then she's like picking the clothes down and putting them down. You know, picking clothes and putting them down. And picking clothes and putting them down. And she goes, yeah, and there I was. And I got to my last piece of clothing. That's when I saw the goanna. I said, okay, yeah, sure. I said, what did you do? She goes, well, I started whipping away the goanna, didn't I? I said, yeah, that, that's fine. What was this piece of clothing? Are you okay? Is the clothing okay? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, well, the last piece of clothing, that was my bra. <laughs> and there was this silence between us. <laughs> and I just went, 
you know, you've got a great commercial there. <laughs> she goes, what? She goes, just imagine the scene you described to me, and at the end of that, the tagline is, burly bras, support when you need it most. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she had a great laugh, we had a great laugh, and we had this great conversation between us about wildlife, etc. And it was just that thing, just like, what else can I do with this situation? Just be playful with it. And I think that's that, that kind of spirit that the sandpit sand provides in us. Um, I don't know if it is a good adam, it might be. It's like a But we are, I mean, and I think the, the beautiful thing too is that I'm going back to the Australian culture and the, the mannerisms again, but I think one of the beauties of the Australian culture too is that we're quite an innovative lot. We're quite a kind of creative lot. You know, we've, we've, we've invented the, the, the black box recorder, inflatable slides coming out of the, uh, the skate hatches out of the planes, uh, latex gloves, hills hoist, victim mowers, Vegemite, which is a Sensational invention. <laughs> so we have we've invented some excellent, excellent um, innovations. And I think that's something to encourage in all of us, that we have that ability within all of us to do that uh, once we can kind of be playful and, 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 and give it a go. So at the start, I, I, I um, started off by the cultural habit of hello, there you go, how's things? And in the Australian culture, we do the same when we say goodbye. Okay. All right, mate. Catch you later. Yep. All right. See ya. Yeah. Okay. Bye. We don't just say goodbye. It's like, nah, mate. Okay. What? Right. You're all right. We'll catch you next week. Yeah. All right, mate. Yeah. All right. See you then. Okay. Bye, mate. Okay. I count it all the time as well. You know. So I'm saying goodbye to you guys. I guess I encourage you to find your sandpit, wherever that might be. Invite your friends in. Invite your mates, your colleagues, whatever it is. Get in there, play. Nudge the comfort zone. You know, because that's where a lot of that learning happens. That Zelko talked about. And in that learning, I guess that's where we get to expand our, our potential, get to expand our capabilities. And that's what I think playfulness really gives us, is that opportunity to do that and more of what we, what we can be. So thank you very much for, for, for being part of it and being involved and giving the activities a go. Thank you very much. Thank you.